We've seen a lot of explosions in the previous episodes. We started with Trinity, the first nuclear explosion in 1945. We saw that the blast radius was proportional to time to the power 2 over 5. Following Taylor, in episode 1 we saw that this power law could be understood as a scaling law, relating the kinematics of the radius to the mechanical ratio between the energy E of the explosion and the density rho of the ambient air. The second episode showed that this scaling applied to a large class of small and large explosions. And in the last episode, we got a bit more precise and introduced the Taylor set of constants, called delta in its reduced form. A number close to 1, varying a little from one explosion to another, and allowing us to replace the approximate equality sign by a more serious-looking equality. A very nice example of a scaling law. Yet, we alluded a few times to the fact that the explosion seems to depart from this scaling at very short timescales, in particular for the data point at 0.1 millisecond. If measurement had been made at earlier times, we have doubts that the radius would have complied to Taylor scaling. We will see in the next episode that these doubts are well founded. Today, we will talk about the other side. In this fourth episode on explosion, we will discuss the late dynamics, beyond the time range following Taylor scaling. The last picture used by Taylor was taken 62 milliseconds after detonation. But the explosion did not stop there. Here is a picture at 72 milliseconds, one at 81, 90 milliseconds, 109, 127 milliseconds. The explosion keeps going for sure, but how does the radius evolve in this extended time range? Luckily, the explosion doesn't go on according to Taylor's regime forever. Let's imagine for a moment that it did. Then, one hour after detonation, the radius of the blast would be over 15 km. Pretty bad news for all the personnel in the shelters around 9 km away from ground zero. And if nothing was there to stop it, the interplay of energy and density would keep going. The 10 miles line would be crossed after 66 minutes, 20 miles after 6 hours. The speed of the blast is decreasing, but it does not stop. 17 hours after detonation, the explosion would close in on the neighboring town of Socorro, in the northwest on the map. By today, 2022, 77 years after detonation, Taylor scaling would predict a blast with a radius over 3,000 kilometers. Bad news for a lot of people. So what prevented this apocalyptic scenario from happening? What sets the final blast radius of an explosion? Somewhere beyond the time range studied by Taylor, we expect the blast to reach a plateau, a final radius. But where is it? At which distance, capital D, does the explosion stop? It is quite clear that the distance D must depend on the energy E of the explosion. Larger explosions would extend further. To solve this riddle, we go back to Taylor's method, as outlined in episode 1. Like the prefactor k of the 2 over 5 power law before, the geometric quantity d can be written as a ratio of energy and a yet unknown quantity q. And as before, the dimensions must match. d is just a length, so this mess of dimensions on the right-hand side must simplify to a length. Of course, mass cancels out. It was constructed as a dummy dimension, so it is playing its role. In addition, the time dimension must disappear, which means that the time exponent of the quantity q must be the same as the time exponent of energy, so y is equal to minus 2, and the time dimension disappears. The equation we're left with is pretty simple. It just states that beta times 2 minus x must equal to 1, that is, beta equals 1 over 2 minus x. Once the dimensions of the mechanical quantity q are known, the way the final radius varies with the energy is known, that is, beta is known. And vice versa, if the scaling exponent beta between the final radius and the energy is known, then the underlying mechanical quantity q is discovered. Different choices are possible for the quantity q, associated with different values of the space exponent x, and so leading to different scaling exponent 1 over 2 minus x, for the relationship between d and the energy e. 
We will come back on this multiplicity of solutions at the end of this video. For now, we will consider an important case, when x is equal to minus 1. In that particular case, the final radius d is expected to be proportional to the cubic root of the energy E. What kind of mechanical quantity Q has dimensions m, l minus 1, t minus 2? It has different names depending on the context. It is sometimes called a pressure, or an elastic modulus, of which there can be a lot of kinds. Young modulus, bulk modulus, shear modulus, etc. These differences won't concern us for now, and we will call Q by an umbrella term. We will say that Q is a stress, and we will use the symbol sigma to refer to it. A higher value of this stress leads to a smaller final radius, since sigma is in the denominator. Where does this stress come from? What is its value for different explosions? Tech Trinity. What kind of stress sigma could limit the advancement of the explosion front? What about the atmospheric pressure itself? The air around the explosion must be pushing back. If we assume that the atmospheric pressure gives the relevant stress, then sigma is around 1 atmosphere, that is 10 to the 5 pascals. And the energy for Trinity is around 20 kilotons of TNT, so around 8, 10 to the 13 joules. Dividing the energy and stress and taking the cubic root, we get a final radius around 1 kilometer. This radius is what we call the final blast radius. In a few episodes, we'll see that within this limit, the explosion produced so-called overpressures, significantly higher than the atmospheric baseline. For now, this blast radius is just the length built from the ratio of energy and stress, like the prefactor K of Taylor was built from energy and density. Can this blast radius be observed? Taylor's 2 over 5 scaling intersects with the constant distance d, a few seconds after detonation. How does the explosion look like around that time? This is precisely a picture of Trinity, 3 seconds after detonation. During these few seconds, the ball of fire in the middle starts to rise, but the blast near the ground seems to have reached its maximal extent. The horizontal red line drawn here is 2 kilometers long, extending 1 kilometer on each side of ground zero. Note how the dust cloud near the ground, on the right, does not extend beyond this limit. This is the final blast radius d. And indeed, from 3 to 15 seconds after detonation, the explosion front reaches this final radius. Rough measurements of the horizontal extent of the dust cloud confirm the relevance of the length scale d. The final blast radius is equal to the cubic root of the ratio of energy and stress. This scaling is confirmed by measuring the final blast radii for atmospheric explosions with different yields. What you see here is the final blast radius for bombs of 1 kiloton, which is around 400 meters, 100 kiloton, almost 2 kilometers, and 10 megatons, over 8 kilometers. And Trinity, with an energy around 20 kilotons, and the final radius around 1 kilometer, as we have seen. All final radii follow the same parallel, where the radius is proportional to e to the power 1 over 3, which we know to mean that a stress sigma is involved. For atmospheric explosions, the stress is indeed close to the atmospheric pressure sigma note, equal to one atmosphere. This is true for nuclear and conventional atmospheric explosions. No need to take this 0.7 factor too seriously for now, since it depends on the precise way d is measured, on the threshold of overpressure used to define it. More dramatic results are seen if we consider explosions that are happening underground. This was the case for Project Gnome in 1961. A 3 kiloton nuclear bomb was detonated 361 meters below ground, producing a cavity with an average radius of 20 meters. This enormous cavern measures about 170 feet across and is almost 90 feet high. Here, 1,200 feet beneath the Earth's surface, this underground laboratory was open for inspection to official observers and members of the press, where the phenomena from a contained nuclear explosion is being studied. How can we understand this radius d of the cavity? Can we use the same formula for d 
based on the ratio of energy and stress? If we were to put the cavity radius of GNOME on this plot, the data point would be much lower than the atmospheric trend. Does this mean that the formula for the final radius d is wrong for underground explosions? No, just that the relevant stress sigma is not the same for atmospheric and underground tests. We know how to estimate the stress that would result in such a cavity. We just have to invert the equation. Plugging in the value of energy and size d, we get a stress in the gigapascal range, which is the right order of magnitude for the crystalline salt formation called allite, surrounding the explosion. So for the gnome underground explosion, the cavity radius is expressed by the same formula, but with a different value of the stress sigma, whereas for atmospheric explosions, sigma is roughly the atmospheric pressure. For underground explosion, it is the elastic modulus of the surrounding rocks. This would be similar for underwater explosions, while the bulk modulus is also in the gigapascal range. Much more data points could be added to this graph, but we have to move on. Don't hesitate to leave suggestions of references with more data on this topic in the comments, with the hashtag BlastRadius. So we know where the blast stops, we now can ask when does it stop. We're going to see that the explosion blast stops when the sound catches up with the explosion front. We know Taylor scaling. We don't put in the dimensionless tail set of constant for now because we want to focus on the interplay of mechanical quantities. Here, the kinematics of the explosion depend on the energy and the density of the ambient medium. We also know that the final radius, which depends on the interplay of energy and stress slash pressure slash elastic modulus. What is the time when the two intersect? Easy, we just have to equate the two scalings. And with a little bit of simple algebra, we obtain an expression for the time at the crossover between Taylor's regime and the final radius. We use the symbol tau for this spatial time, so as not to confuse it with t, the time variable. For a particular explosion, tau is a constant. It depends on the three mechanical quantities introduced so far the energy of the bomb, and the density and characteristic stress of the ambient medium. This time scale is not really simple, but it can be written in a few equivalent ways to gain better insight. In particular, we can use the symbol capital D to stand for the cubic root of energy and stress wherever it appears. Now, what's that remaining mechanical ratio between density and stress? Putting it on the other side, it becomes quite clear what it is. It is a distance capital D, over time tau. So the ratio of stress and density must be a constant speed of some kind. We call it C. The blue line here would correspond to a length D growing at a constant speed C. Remember that the log scale can be a little bit misleading. Here, the red line of Taylor scaling and the blue line at constant speed actually meet at T is equal zero, as can be seen in linear scale. Although Taylor's regime starts off with a much higher instantaneous speed, the front progressively slows down until the regime at constant speed c catches up with it. This speed c is the speed of sound. This speed c is a kinematic quantity, and it is expressed as a ratio of two mechanical quantities, just like Taylor prefactors was. Taylor's prefactor comes from a ratio of energy and density, whereas here, the speed of sound is built as a ratio of stress and density. In each material, with density rho and characteristic stress sigma, there is an associated sound speed. This speed is a so-called material property, because it does not depend on any external input, like the energy E of the bomb. In air, the stress is around the atmospheric pressure, and density is around 1 kg per meter cube, so the speed of sound in air is about 300 meters per second. This is why you can roughly know how far a lightning stroke by counting how many seconds separate the moment you see the light and when you hear thunder. A 3 seconds lag time would place the strike around a kilometer away. Plugging in different values of the stress and density get us estimates of the speed of sound in different materials. For water, we would get something around 1500 meters per second, the speed at which the songs of whales travel. For a solid like steel, 
the speed is even higher, around 5,000 meters per second, so you could hear the train coming from miles away. Let's make a mini summary of where we are at. We started with a single regime, Taylor's regime, since it comes out naturally from taking into account energy and density. We'll just call it the energy density regime, or E rho. We know that once we have the mechanical quantities, we can get back the 2 over 5 scaling easily. We then saw that by also considering the characteristic stress sigma of the surrounding medium, we did not just get a scaling for the final blast radius, but we also got a third regime for free, the one describing the propagation of sound in the surrounding medium. We do not put data points on this line, but experiments measuring the distance traveled by sound would be on that line, whether the sound comes from a lighting bolt or from someone clapping its ends. The final radius is the regime uniquely associated with the pair energy-stress, whereas the sound propagation regime is uniquely associated with the pair stress-density. We got three regimes for the price of two. And it's now time to investigate more precisely what's going on at their intersection. For a given explosion, this intersection defines a characteristic length and time, which can be used as objective units to understand large sets of explosion. These units, solely based on energy, density, and stress, are the upkinson krenz units. Meet Bertram Upkinson and Carl Krenz. The two men generally created it for what we're about to discuss. Hopkinson was British, Krenz was German. Both worked on explosion and realized that the blast of different explosions could be superimposed if distance and time were measured in properly scaled units. Let's see what that means. Tech Trinity. Why should we use seconds and meters to measure time and space? The fact that these units are international standards does not mean that they are sacrosanct. We've seen that the interplay of energy, density, and stress leads to a remarkable space-time point associated with a size capital D and a time tau. For Trinity, the values of energy, density, and stress produce a final radius around 1 km and a crossover time around 5 seconds. Instead of using meters and seconds, which are quite subjective units, we could measure the variable blast radius d in units of its final value capital D, and the time variable t in units of the constant crossover time tau. Let's start with size. To measure the variable size d in units of the final radius capital D is to divide the variable d by the constant capital D. This does not change the shape of the plot, but the numbers on the vertical axis. Note that now, 10 to the power 0, that is 1, coincides exactly with the final radius. Since we are comparing one length against another, the ratio d divided by capital D is dimensionless. Now, let's see the time. We can basically do the same thing and measure the variable t with the constant tau. So we get a dimensionless t over tau, and of course, the intersection of the three regimes occurred at t over tau is equal to 1, by construction. All of this may sound a little bit silly, but this approach suddenly makes sense when considering a range of explosions of different sizes, not just one. Lucky for us, we've spent the last couple of episodes collecting such a set of explosions. Trinity is here. The plot also includes a number of other atmospheric nuclear explosions, conventional explosions, underwater explosions, and laser-induced explosions. When we represent these different explosions on a plot where time is always measured in seconds and distance in meters, the explosions appear quite different, from microscopic to terrifying. Since the scale varies so much, it can be hard to believe that all these dynamics essentially display the same interplay of energy and density of Taylor's regime. The upkinson krenz units point out that in each of these explosions, we have three constant mechanical properties the energy of the explosion, E, and the density and characteristic stress of the surrounding medium. So even if the data do not extend far enough to capture the final blast radius, we can estimate it, as well as the associated crossover time, by computing them 
from the formulas that connect them to the three mechanical parameters. The opkitson krantz units are here written in a rather modern way, owing to a century of refinements since the original formulation. You can check a recent study by Vey and Argather for a summary of these developments. When it will become necessary, we will use subscripts, recalling the three mechanical quantities of this system of units. This is but the first example of a mechanical system of units. The formulas may be a bit off-putting, but they are actually direct consequences of dimensional analysis. The characteristic length and time of this system are the only ones that can be produced by combining only energy, density, and stress. We will discuss this more broadly in the general series on mechanics, so we'll skip the details here. Then, for each experiment, we can use the constant values of energy, density, and stress to compute the units of space and time and use these units instead of meters and seconds. We've done this with Trinity already. Here are the data for the apple shot, Maple, Climax, Grable, and Usatonic. If the datasets exactly followed Taylor regime, they would be on this red line, which is expressed pretty neatly in scaled units. You can check that this equation is equivalent to that one, just by plugging in the definitions of the hopkinson krantz units of length and time. Now, all datasets are not far from Taylor's bear regime, but they are not right there. Usitonic is the one further away from the scaling law, and we've seen all of this already in the previous episode. For each explosion, the offset is given by the dimensionless constant delta, which we call the reduced Taylor set of constant. The same delta remains if the equation is written in scaled units. To overlap more neatly all the blast curves, we can factor delta into the units of space and time. The stars on the units recall that we've put a little bit of the Taylor set of constants in them. The procedure to absorb the constants into the units is pretty straightforward, but we'll talk about it more generally in another video. The result is that it allows to align all curves together. We can now include data on conventional explosions, like the explosion of a 100 ton of TNT, the Beirut 2020 explosion, 1 gram of TNT equivalent, 10 milligrams. The laser-induced explosions also overlap, and so do the underwater, nuclear, and conventional explosions. Using these scale units instead of the meter and second, the similarity in the kinematics of this mini-explosion is much more obvious than before. The absolute international units of second and meter put the emphasis on the large range of scales of the explosion, but clouds their similarity. In the last two episodes, when we plotted these datasets, we purposely focused on the part of the data abiding to Taylor's regime. But some of these datasets extend beyond. The full available range is also displayed in the Hopkinson krantz units. Most of the dynamics follow the 2 over 5 energy density regime, that is Taylor scaling. The horizontal red dotted line is the final blast radius, which is the energy stress regime. And we know that there is a third scaling law we get for free, the stress density regime which gives the propagation of sound. At early times, the data obviously depart from Taylor's regime, and they seem to do so at different values of the scale time. This will be the subject of the next episode. At the other end, what is going on around the hopkinson krantz space-time point, where the three regimes cross? Is the explosion stopping at the final blast radius, or does it keep on along the constant speed curve? Well, both, depending on what you call the front of the explosion. The blast itself will stop, but the shock front associated with it detaches and carries on. Back to our favorite example, Trinity. The data used by Taylor follows his 2 over 5 scaling. And later on, we know from the dust cloud that the blast stops somewhere around 1 km away from ground zero. What is going on in between? Well, a lot. In standard units, the time range extends from around 70 milliseconds to 5 seconds. Let's see how the explosion looks a bit before 25 milliseconds after detonation. As pointed out by Mac in his 1947 unclassified report, initially, the front of the explosion is very sharp, but the picture corresponding to the next data point, at 34 milliseconds, starts to show two nested fronts, 
On the outside is the faint shock wave or shock front. And inside is a brighter flame front or fireball. As time goes by, the shock front detaches completely from the fireball. The fireball radius reaches a maximum and the shock front becomes more and more transparent as it moves away and slows down. All of this was thoroughly quantified for the Trinity explosion. We've seen already that the data points used by Taylor only represented a few pictures and classified in 1947. The full 1946 report by Mac includes an absolutely grandiose plot of the measurements made by his team. The screen doesn't really do it justice. You can get the full report on the website of the Atomic Heritage Foundation. First, the full dataset from Max's report completes Taylor's subset of the time range abiding to the 2 over 5 scaling, but the report also included measurements of the radius of the shock front. Beyond a point, the transparency of the front prevented optical measurements, but pressure measurements can track the shock front further. We'll discuss how this is done in more detail at the end of the series on explosion. Mac and his team also tracked the radius of the fireball. The fireball reaches a final radius about an order of magnitude smaller than the final blast radius. Still, this gives a ball of fire with a radius around 200 meters. The same detachment between the fireball and the shock front can also be seen quite clearly on this film of the Dominico Satonic test. Combining values of the final radius of the fireball for explosion with different yield would reveal that the fireball maximum size is proportional to the energy E to the power 1 over 5. So what are the dimensions of the other quantity Q, and where do you think it comes from? Let us know what you think in the comments with the hashtag fireball. We might come back to this in the future, and we'll talk about how this fireball rises in another series on buoyancy. For now, we will focus on the shock and final blast radius. For all the other explosions, we similarly ignore the fireball once it detaches from the shock, and since all the datasets on this plot belong to Trinity, we'll use the same color and symbol. Adding back all the other explosions in our collection, we see that we still have something obvious to discuss. The very early dynamics of explosions do not abide to Taylor scaling. This will be the topic of the next episode on explosions.